I spent the night in jail on LSD. What was also going on at that time was a lot of drinking alone by myself. Things were really falling apart. My relationship with the, a woman that I was living with had ended. Friends didn't want to be around me. I, I was charged with two felonies, possession of narcotics with intent to sell. My lawyer was like, look, you're going to go to jail for a, a decent amount of time here because this wasn't my first brush with the law. Dear Family is a podcast hosted by Rachel Steinman, a writer, an educator, and a mental health advocate. And Rachel gets us up close and personal, so we feel a strong connection, familiarity, and comfort with her guests. So settle in and join us as we search for true healing and journey with Rachel and her most interesting guests. Welcome everyone to another episode of Dear Family, the podcast. I'm so thrilled to have you and so grateful that you're listening and joining me on this wellness journey. I love my next guest, John Lair. What a funny guy, honestly. I wish you could have seen my face on our Zoom. It was a huge grin from ear to ear, even during some of the really difficult discussions. He made me laugh, I have to say. He just has that effect. I know you're going to really enjoy our conversation. Thank you so much for listening, for subscribing, for following me on all the social media platforms at Right Now Rachel. That's right with a W. And by the way, if you have any thoughts on future guests, I'd love to hear you and you can reach out to me on my website. As a big, huge favor to me, I would love you to give me a five-star review. It really does help me more than you know. This is a big labor of love, and that is just a way for you to give back to me. So thank you for doing that. Take care of yourself. I know that this is such a crazy political season right now. This moment we are in is stranger than fiction. We never could have imagined. It's so important for us to not only look out for our physical health with this pandemic weighing over us and and COVID being so scary and continue to wear your mask, but check in on your loved ones and take care of your mental health. It really is so important. John Lair is a comedic performer, writer, and producer who works in television, film, and theater. He grew up in Kansas and made his way to Chicago for college. He began substitute teaching while moonlighting as an improvisational comic, all the while abusing drugs and alcohol. He made his way to Los Angeles and got roles on TV shows like Friends and Jesse, among others. He's also known as the original Geico caveman from the wildly successful commercial campaign. He hit his rock bottom when he got arrested and spent the night in jail high on LSD with the threat of a prolonged incarcerated stay. He's been sober for over two decades and he calls himself a recovering alcoholic and drug addict who regularly attends AA meetings, meditates, and even found spirituality by converting to Judaism. He performs his comedic lectures about his 20 plus years of sobriety at fundraisers, nonprofits, and sober communities under the banner Cold Sober Comedy. He connects with his audience now virtually through Zoom by sharing his personal and career struggles, his continuing sober journey, and the importance of an authentic sense of humor. John and his producing partner, Nancy Hauer, have created multiple projects, most involving their unique improvisationally based hybrid style with their Howler Monkey Productions. John is married to author Jennifer Lair, with whom he has two children, and he's grateful every day for the life he has created. I want to start by thanking our mutual friend, Meredith Morton, who said you have got to get John on your podcast. And I'm so grateful you said yes. Thank you, because you've never met me and you just went on Meredith's words. Going on Meredith's word is not a hard thing to do. She's very strong, opinionated woman who knows her stuff. And any friend of Meredith's is a friend of mine. This is a podcast called Dear Family about our complicated families and also about finding mental wellness. I like to start by asking my guests to tell us a little bit about themselves and their families. I have a son and a daughter. My daughter, Jules, is 14. 
My son is 12. My wife, Jennifer, is middle-aged like me. We had kids, I guess, by the rest of the country later in life. I'm 54, so I was 40 when I had Jules. We started out as the couple that was never, ever going to have kids. We were so sure of it. We're both artists. She's a writer. She she also got her MFA in fine arts. And uh, I'm a performer and a writer for television, comedy mainly. We were never going to have kids ever, ever, ever. And then she woke up one day and was like, we're having kids. And we tried once and she was pregnant with Jules. And then my life changed forever. I love being a father. It's the best thing ever. I can't believe that I ever thought that I shouldn't have done it. My kids are my priority. And and that gets in the way when I'm sure affected my career. One of the things that drives people crazy is I don't want to be one of those dads who's on the phone when he's around his kids all the time. So I don't answer my phone if my kids are around, which pisses people off in this day and age where you're supposed to be reachable 24 seven. That probably causes the most trouble That's in my so life. It's so amazing that yeah. you have that understanding of being present around your kids. What a gift to give them. I know. They don't realize it now, but... They don't. (laughs) It's so funny because I had planned to do this podcast yesterday and I was driving my son and I said to him, listen, I promised to do this podcast. I'm going to do it while we're driving. He was like, what? You know, because I I don't do that stuff. And uh, yeah. Well, I'm excited to reschedule just so we could talk about some things that we don't have to worry about 12 year old ears hearing. Yeah. Yes. And so does he. But yeah, I mean, that's probably the hardest thing to navigate is because we can do work 24 seven now, our computers and our phones and everything is how to carve that out. Not about getting them off their phones. That, I have less of a difficulty. It's more about keeping me off mine or keeping people from trying to get me on mine. It's interesting having kids older in life. You realize family is so important. And when someone's on their deathbed, it's not about work that they're reminiscing. It's about family and loved ones. I, I'm happy for you that your wife changed her mind. <laughs> well, you grew up in Kansas in the 70s. What was that like? I always say to people, Kansas is a great place to grow up if you're wise male, Christian, and straight. And I was all of those things, so it was great. I went all the way through high school in Kansas, and somehow a high school teacher convinced me to apply for Northwestern on the north side of Chicago, and I did and got in, and that changed my life. That changed everything. I have a big extended family in Kansas. Most of them are from a little town outside of Wichita called El Dorado, not El Dorado, El Dorado. Like 16,000 people. It's probably less than that now. My father moved us up to Kansas City. So we were like the city arm of the Lears. When I moved to Chicago and really saw what it was like to be in a big city, that really changed my life. And when I saw that I could make a living or whatever you want to call it, performing, it was a life change that I'm so lucky to have experienced. You went to Northwestern in 1988 and you set out to be a teacher. You were doing improv on the side. By the way, my past life, I'm a credentialed teacher. I taught kindergarten and elementary school grades. You worked as a substitute teacher on the north side of Chicago. And then when you moved to LA, you continued to work as a sub in South Central Los Angeles. Some of that comes into your comedy. Can you tell us what was that like? It was crazy. I've been sober now for 24 years. I was using and drinking during that time. The reason I say that is because I want to shade it. I'm not this fantastic guy. But look, I was a male teacher who was willing to go to the inner city I was credentialed for high school, but Chicago Public Schools was like, no, we're sending you to elementary. I started substitute teaching because I was doing theater at night. I was doing improv in clubs at night, late at night. Were you ever at Second City? That's so cool. And then I quickly got involved in a theater company called Ed, E-D, which now is called Long Form, but that wasn't the name for it. A style of improv, which is more on scenes and storytelling and less on games and sketches. It was was finding something slightly more deep, but still funny. Don't get me wrong. So I was doing that at night and teaching elementary school during the day. And I taught fifth and sixth grade. And I was definitely on drugs and, and drinking heavily, but I was able to pull it together enough to follow a lesson plan. 
Yeah. Yeah. And it's so funny because now years later, those kids that I taught are grownups and now they reach out to me. I'm sure you have the same experience, which is so crazy. And their experience was like, you were great. We loved you. And you know, my experience (laughs) was like, I was out of my mind and showing up two hours sleep, but it definitely shaped who I am. and And it gave me a sense of what the bigger world was like and what being in a diverse community where I was a minority really changed my perspective of the world. Definitely eye-opening. What happened when you got arrested and you were high on LSD? Wow, you're so good. You really (laughs) operate the Google machine good. It was my friend's 30th birthday party and we went out and dropped acid in Ventura County and I was arrested. I spent the night in jail on LSD. Now, It's a great story, and I talk about it in my comedy all the time, and people love it. The reality of it was, though, was that it's a great story, and alcoholics are great storytellers. What was also going on at that time was a lot of drinking alone by myself. Things were really falling apart. My relationship with a woman that I was living with had ended. Friends didn't want to be around me, except for these two who I went camping with. Looking back... I had plenty of sufficiently strong reasons to quit drinking and using prior to that. Why I quit after that instance, I have no idea. I mean, I was definitely looking at some serious time. I I was charged with two felonies, possession of narcotics with intent to sell. I had no intention of selling any of them. They were all going to go in my body that weekend. But I was looking at some time and my lawyer was like, look, you're going to go to jail for a decent amount of time here because this wasn't my first brush with the law. I had every reason to get sober and I did. But Now, 24 years later, looking back on it, did I want to get sober any more at that point than I wanted before it? No. I don't know why it happened that time. I grace. It happened. And it was outside of my control. That's that's the way I look at it now. Back then, I thought, okay, I'm really in trouble. Now I'm going to quit. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm going to make it happen. But that was a fallacy. Just wasn't really the case. For whatever reason, whichever way you want to look at it, I got sober at that time. Did you have to stay in jail or you got out? No, crazy thing is that the officer who searched us screwed up on the search. He filled out the form incorrectly and it all got thrown out. I didn't even get a ticket. I didn't get a DUI nothing. Well, there's some more grace for you. So yeah. yeah. Wow. I was like, whoa. And I sort of thought getting sober was like a self-help kind of thing. And I would start making more money. I had this idea in my head that the only reason I wasn't rich and successful was because I was drinking and using. So now that I had stopped drinking and using, now suddenly money was just going to flow into my life and I was going to have sex with beautiful women and drive a fancy car. And none of that happened. (laughs) Right. That's when the hard work started. I'm going to quote you. You said, quote, what people don't realize about addicts and alcoholics, it makes it easier to live with them, take it away. And then the real dragon comes out. What did you mean by that? I always thought that an alcoholic is somebody who drank. And when you stop drinking, you stop becoming an alcoholic. But what I found was when I stopped drinking, the real issue was actually being medicated. It wasn't the drinking and it was the thinking. It was who I was that I self-medicated because it worked. It helped that part of me, that really selfish, insecure, self-centered, egomaniacal, narcissistic part of myself. It medicated that so that I could exist out in the world. The reason I stopped or the reason it was taken from me was because it stopped working. And then the real diseased side of my Myself came out because I was now unmedicated. What I call the dragon really came out. In a word, I was just a dick, really. Just a person who was incapable of caring about anybody but myself. And that can get really complex. I can have all kinds of appearances of caring about other people and I can play at it. But when I really looked at it, and this took years and years, there was always an angle that I could justify serving my own needs. And so finding a way to actually care about somebody, authentically care was a trip. I think a lot of people self-medicate mental health issues and 
it's often a mask covering problems. You took the drugs and the alcohol away and you had to do the real work and you've been sober for 24 years, which is amazing. I'm so impressed. That, that is a huge feat. My brother's sober for almost 15 years now. He was addicted to crystal meth, of all things, cool. used yeah. it through law school. Do you go to AA meetings still? Very involved in AA and a sober community in many ways. My path for sobriety is a spiritual path. I've come to believe I need a spiritual connection in order to stay sober and to grow within sobriety. I was a complete atheist and had absolutely no interest in spiritual matters and scoffed at them and thought they were silly and and pointless under the guise of science and, and logic and things like that. It's taken a long time to find an authentic path for myself that's meaningful to me and it's constantly changing. One thing that a lot of alcoholics and addicts vibe to is that we're seekers. We're seeking something. The name for alcohol, spirits, you know, we're looking for something bigger than ourselves and that we didn't realize that we were drinking to have fun or whatever, but it was this bigger feeling. I took, uh, I took a lot of hallucinogenic. I took everything. I took heroin. I took cocaine. I did anything I could get my hands on. But uh, I think the hallucinogenics, I always describe it to people as like, it's a way to look into God's house, the window. You don't go in, you're not in there, but you can kind of get a sense of what this bigger spiritual thing is like. And it's all artificial, but it still gives you a chance to get a sense of it. And for somebody who had no ability to connect to anything bigger than myself, drugs and alcohol served that. Once they're taken away and I'm treating the real disease, one of the biggest things that I had to reckon with, and I tell people it's a harsh joke that you got to take, is that I'm not God. I may not know who God is or what God is or where God is, but I know it's not me. That's a big, yeah. that's a big step for an, an alcoholic drug addict who's lived on self-will to take. It's like, fuck, I can't fix me. My brain doesn't work when it comes to fixing me. Tell me if I'm wrong, but I read somewhere that you admit that you suffer from depression and there's a fine line that separates laughter and pain. There are a lot of comedians that deal with depression. I, I don't know if there's some correlation there. What do you think about that fine line between humor and pain? And do you want to tell us a little bit about your depression? I don't really look at depression or alcoholism as something that's cured, more about something that you own and that you treat, but it works the other way too. In treating my alcoholism and my depression, it has led to things I never would have gotten out of life if I didn't have those two things, which sounds crazy. No, I is. love that so much. That's such a great realization. I remember hearing people saying, I'm a grateful alcoholic and I'm like, what? What kind of crazy person is that? But I am forced to do things to treat my depression and alcoholism that normal people aren't forced to do because I'm forced to do it it's given me a take on life that people who aren't alcoholic or depressants will never have. I'm one of these people who believes that there's a spiritual solution. Now, don't get me wrong. I take medication for depression. I believe in doctors. I believe in science. I, I believe in a committee approach. <laughs> I have a sponsor. I have a shrink. I have a therapist. I have a medical doctor. I take meditation classes. I am forced to really find an authentic spiritual journey for myself that my wife, who's a normal person, isn't really forced to. Her well-being doesn't depend on it in the same way that mine does. So I go to meetings and I meditate and I do all of these things because if I don't, I'll destroy everything around me. Whereas if she doesn't, you know. She, she might be a little cranky or whatever. Yeah. yeah. It's a totally different way of looking. Uh, I really do appreciate that you said that because I think the listeners should know that sometimes the hardest things in your life are really gifts. And and you may not be where you are in your life with your kids to be so present had you not gone through all the hardships. And I, I just love hearing a dad say that. Like that to me is so awesome, really. Well, thank you. And <laughs> thank you. I love being alive. I would even go further and say that the worst things that happen to us always turn out to be 
the gasoline that brings out the best part of us. It always is. In my world where I I work with a lot of newly sober people, I'm in that world a lot. I do comedy for treatment centers and charity events. It's a big part of my life. Every time I hear an alcoholic talk about getting sober and being sober, they always say a version of this. I thought it was the worst thing in my life. And now looking back, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Me getting arrested that night was terrible. It was terrible. I mean, high powered acid, believe me, it was terrible. Being in a county jail is just a terrible, terrible place to be. It was the best thing ever happened to me. And I have seven or eight of those stories. The things that were the worst thing that ever happened to me are the things that attract people into my life who need help because we share that. And then I'm able to help them, not because I'm a shrink, I'm not qualified to do anything except share my experience, but in doing that, it helps them. The worst thing that ever happened to you always turns out to be the thing that can be the, the gasoline towards helping the world. It's crazy, but it's true. Yeah, I hope that this 2020, we come out better for it. I really do. We got off track with the question about the fine line of comedians having oh, depression. Do you find that? Oh, what is that older. about? Listen, you do stand-up comedy and you hang out with the comedians backstage. They're miserable. And they're so funny. And they're so funny. I I don't know. I think you're so sad you have to laugh. And I think that's part of it. And it's the only way to survive. And it's the way to tap into being of service to the world because you're putting something out there. And I think it keeps us going in a way and keeps us from killing ourselves. Lots of comedians do commit suicide. I think all alcoholics and drug addicts are all committing suicide. They don't have the balls to really do it. So they do it slowly. And I think comedians getting laughter, it's self-serving, but it also helps others just enough to keep them from offing themselves. Really good humor is able to walk that that line of seeing the funny side of it, something that's tragic. And particularly with addicts and alcoholics, you get around a bunch of sober addicts that are alcoholics talking and they'll talk about the darkest stuff and laugh hilariously at it. And people who aren't addicts or alcoholics will hear that and go, how can you laugh at that? But the answer is, how can you not? Right. I guess I'm a quote for me, but I would laugh at that because I'm a great. You were on the still very popular show Friends and (laughs) you played Chandler's roommate before Joey in the episode called The One with the Flashback. You were a fashion photographer who was having models come to the house. Your uh, sister was in porn. Of course, Chandler wanted a room with you. I was obsessed with that show in the 90s. And then my daughters, it has like a whole resurgence. They were obsessed with it. You had long hair in the show, right? Do yes. people recognize you? They did back then. But I haven't <laughs> been recognized for the Friends thing in a long time. Look, I've done a ton of stuff in my own shows. And we'll talk about that. We'll talk my about own that. shows. The only thing my 14-year-old daughter cares about is the <laughs> one of Friends that I did. That, when she heard that, so she was, funny. you were in Friends? And I was like, yeah, but it's a small part. Oh my God, you know, that now I'm suddenly cool with her friends. Great. Uh, Was that your first big break? I had done other shows, but it was the first time I'd done a show on a number one big show like that. Right. I had done stuff before that. I'd been in some Noah Baumbach movies. I had done an episode of Lois and Clark. Remember that? I'd done little things here and there, but that Friends thing was... That's so funny. And it's still, I'm sure, the gift that keeps on giving. Oh, God. Thank God. Another big break and exciting moment for you was when you became the metrosexual caveman for the Geico commercials. And I'm going to Now, quote Forbes. Forbes said, your character somehow eluded extinction while developing a taste for racquetball and duck with mango salsa and was insulted by Geico's ad tagline, quote, so easy a caveman can do it. It was such a funny bit. I would actually pause my TiVo to watch the commercial. Remember (laughs) TiVo? You were invited to the Oscars and you went in full makeup and they gave you a hot babe 
to put on your arm and yeah. all the stars wanted to take pictures with you. How fun that must have been. Tell us about that wild ride. It was just such a bizarre thing. I, it started with an audition for a commercial and I was playing the character of a caveman. A commercial auditions are strange because you get them the day before and you go to these big cattle calls. It's so bizarre, the whole world of commercial auditions. I walked in and they said you could improvise. And that's my thing. I, I love to improvise. So I just improvised a ton and that got me the job. And then when we did the first one, there was all this makeup and it was real weird. It was, it's really trippy. Human beings don't like to have stuff glued on our faces and people kind of freak out and can't handle it. It's hard to explain, but it's like the very big awkward. bulging brow bone kind of thing, right? All the hair and yeah. the and the, oh my God, there was, it was all this stuff. And I did the first one and I was glad to have it. This was back when commercials still paid well. And I didn't think much of it. And then they called to do another one and I was like, what? Jennifer Googled it and she goes, I think this caveman thing is a big deal because we also had TiVo and we didn't watch commercials. I didn't even know anything about it. And man, that thing exploded. I ended up doing over 25 nationals, wow. which is insane. That's awesome. Um, That's I bought so my cool. house. Thank you, Geico. Thank you. There's and another was, commercial for them. <laughs> yeah. Most of the famous lines were improvised lines. It's still funny. It still holds true because yeah. I spent some time looking at them. There's a whole roll of them all together. Yeah. It's very, very funny. People don't recognize you for that, I'm guessing. No. <laughs> Every now and then they will by my voice. Like if I tell them I'm the guy go okay, man, and then they'll go, oh my God. My daughter was a baby when I did the first one. My wife brought her to set and we were a little nervous how she'd feel about me looking the way I did. And she just looked right at me and said, daddy, <laughs> it's all right through all of it. Yeah. yeah that's amazing. She wasn't freaking out. We're going to talk a little bit about your wife, Jennifer. In 2017, she wrote a very well-received parenting manual called Parents Speak, What's Wrong with How We Talk to Our Children and What to Say Instead. As I was researching, I was thinking, oh, I need to have her on. 13 years earlier, in 2014, she wrote a memoir, and I love memoirs, so I'm going to have to check that out as well, and it's called Ill-Equipped for a Life of Sex. A very intriguing title, especially for her husband. It's a book about sex and she tells everything. My wife has no filter Love and it. it's just a total open book and it's a great book. It's ultimately about relationships because sex is really about intimacy. In telling the book, she talks explicitly about everything, including our marriage and the period when we weren't having sex. People say, I'm, I'm going to read the book. I say, okay, you should. It's a great book, but you're going to feel weird around us after you read it. That's a good memoir then. I highly recommend it. And in the paperback, I got to write a rebuttal chapter, <laughs> which was great. And Payback. Yeah. it's But it, it, honestly, it's about relationships. And I think particularly for women, it's a great book. You um, were fine with her being so public about all of that. Oh yeah. I mean, both are. I mean, I, yeah. I talk about it in my comedy. We're both vomiting our lives out to America. In this day and age, people are so much more open than they used to be, but still, there's sometimes things can be a little too personal. You guys went to couples therapy for two and a half years before getting married. Yes. And at one point, you were very miserable, but you stuck it out. Yeah. And now you have this beautiful marriage and great kids. Why did you guys decide not to give up? Keep in mind, I'm newly sober at this point. So I'm in therapy and working on myself is really important to me. And she was also in therapy. Both of us saw therapy like dentist. If you can afford it, you go. We didn't see it the way a lot of people see it, where it's like, I only go if I have a problem. We sort of assume everybody has a problem. The only major problem you can ever have is to say you don't have any problems. It's like being a white person saying, I'm not racist. That's when you know you're in trouble. Everybody was like, you're going to therapy before you get married? We're like, fuck yeah. We're going to therapy before we get married. And it was the best money we ever spent. There doesn't need to be stigma against therapy. Therapy is meant to make things better. You decided to convert to Judaism. And welcome to the tribe, by the way. And you talk about your spiritual satisfaction and you went to the University of Judaism in Los Angeles and you said you went among a room full of, quote, blonde non-Jews with big rings on. You were probably the only male or maybe not. Well, I shouldn't generalize. Well, no, they, were you? Okay. Well, the yeah. image is very funny to me. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was hilarious. Most people think when they hear that about me, they think that I converted to marry my wife. And that definitely was part of it. 
but her family never made that a thing. I was newly sober. I was trying to figure out spirituality in general, like what the fuck and, and what is this stuff? And Jennifer's family celebrated holidays. They celebrated Shabbat. It was a part of their life. I knew I needed to know more than I did about Judaism. So I took the class. Yeah, it was a conversion class, but I wasn't really taking it to convert. I was taking it to learn about it. And I loved it. I'd grown up without religion. I loved learning about the Old Testament. Judaism is so old and it's so deep and it's so rich. It's like a smorgasbord of things. It was funny. I was doing a show called Jesse, which was also produced by the same producers who did Friends, Friends. Bright Kaufman Crane. And Marta Kaufman gave me a book called The Jew and the Lotus, which changed my life. It's just a simple travel book. I recommend it. It's really the Dalai Lama asks 10 rabbis, I think it's 10, to come visit him to talk about how do you keep your people together when you lose your homeland, something the Dalai Lama was facing. Jews had done it for thousands of years. One of the rabbis who went was this guy, Jonathan Omerman, who was in a wheelchair. How they got him up to the Dalai Lama, I have no idea. He was a Jewish mystic who went back into the Zohar and some of the deep mystic Jewish texts and found these incredible intersections between Judaism and Buddhism. I found out that he taught in Matifta, his school on Jewish mystic meditation in West LA. And I was Love like, it. let I go because I knew I needed to learn how to meditate for my sobriety. And so I took a, a Jewish meditation class. I still use those things today when I meditate. It's basic Buddhist things, but it's through a Jewish lens. Today, I consider myself a Jewish Buddhist. I uh, really relate to Buddhism. It makes a lot of sense to me. It really does. Yeah. Of all non-Asian Buddhist teachers in America are Jewish. Oh, interesting. <laughs> I didn't know that. That makes yeah. sense. When you look into it, there's a lot of intersections. Tell us about cold, sober comedy and where you're giving these lectures. Man, you're amazing. Thank you. I was asked to do a charity event for the Karen, C-A-R-O-N, which is a recovery not-for-profit. They're all over the East Coast, but this one was Atlanta. And they said, hey, we know you talk about your sobriety in your stand-up, can you do something just for uh, addicts for a charity event? And it was about 50% addicts and 50% rich people that they were trying to get to donate. So it was a crazy audience and I did it and I loved it. I lo uh, loved it. Then I did it the following year and then I was like, well, why don't I do this? And so I put together a comedic lecture. I wear a suit. It's like you're going to a college lecture, but I'm having fun with that. And I prove a thesis, but really it's an excuse to talk about sobriety, talk about my own path through it. Before the plague, I performed all over the country. Now I'm putting together a Zoom version of it. I've done it a couple of times. I did it for the recovery conference recently and it went well. So I'm going to do more of them. So the conceit now is I'm teaching an online Zoom class, but it, I'm not teaching anything. I'm just delivering a lecture, which is really a comedic one person show, I guess is the best way to think about it. But people like that. it. Yeah. I love that. Why is it called cold sober? People look at getting sober as like going cold turkey. And really, that isn't what it is at all. You think it is. And it is that for the first couple of days when you're just sort of kicking whatever you're on. But after that, it becomes something totally different. I thought it was a good title. It's a really good title. Tell us about Howler Monkey Productions. Howler Monkey is a, a production company that I am one of the founders of, along with my partner, Nancy Hauer. But the most recent one we've produced was a, a show called Quick Draw that was on Hulu, which I starred in and we both executive produced and she directed and, and we both wrote all the episodes. So we're kind of this two-person band. It was so much fun. And We've done a bunch of pilots. We did a show for TBS called 10 Items or Less. We did a show on Crackle called Jailbait, which was a character of mine that was locked up in jail. And So anyway, great. You and you're doing it. a lot of improv throughout, right? Yeah, it's all the dialogue is improvised. We write really detailed scripts, but we don't show the scripts to the actors. So I'm in every scene, so I do know what where we're going, so I can direct things from within the scene, and Nancy's directing things from outside the scene to get that comedy that improv provides, but at the same time, having a very strong narrative. That sounds uh, so fun. I, I could never do it, but it sounds really fun. You could do it. I feel like I'd be, be laughing at you the whole time. Uh, which is fine. But yeah, it is scary for a lot of people. You were just working on a movie during COVID. How did that work? And what is it? It's called Safer at Home, the coronavirus movie. 
And <laughs> it's an independent film that this young screenplay author sent to me. It's funny. The reason I got into the film was because the, it's only two actors in the film. It's two guys, the whole film. And the other actor was another Geico Caveman, speaking of Geico Caveman. And he recommended me and the guy offered it to me. And I read the script and I just thought it was really great. It's really crazy. It's like a play. It's just two people. And we shot it and with all of the COVID protocols, getting tested every day and the mask, which was truly bizarre. We talked about how substance abuse is often a cover up for mental health issues. And with the stressors of this virus isolating so many of us and so much uncertainty, substance abuse is rampant, especially opiate abuse. What advice do you have for people who are struggling and want to get sober, but they're using it as a crutch? Most of us who have gone through it know that no one other than yourself can get you to take the first step towards sobriety. If you're a loved one, you should talk to them and be honest with them. I'm just saying until they want it, the chances are very, very, very slim. And that's really depressing. And that's why yeah. so few people are able to get sober. But most people who are using and have used for a while have a voice in them that knows that they have a problem and they're gonna die. And that voice is scary. We don't want to look at that voice because we think if we do, we're going to die. But it's actually your brain lying to you. That voice is not the voice that will kill you. It's the voice that will save you. And if you can walk through that wound, you can walk out of it. You really can. The first step you have to take is to wholeheartedly in your own heart that that's where you are. That's who you are. You know it to be true. So it's not asking that much. And tell somebody else. And as soon as you do that, there's all kinds of lifelines that will be thrown to you. And if you keep going, you'll be shocked. And it's worth it. Not only does it get less bad, it gets great, which is the weirdest part, the part that I never truly believed until it happened to me. You just said, tell someone, ask for help. It's brave. It means you want to save yourself. It's so shameful and it's so heartbreaking, but that's a lie. Everybody's broken. Everybody's broken and nobody will think less of you. In fact, they'll think the opposite. An alcoholic addict's brain, you just can't believe what your brain is telling you. So you need to go to somebody else and believe their brain. That's good advice. You have a podcast and <laughs> it's called Generation Gab and your co-host is Chase O'Donnell. Yes. I listened to it the other day. It was really funny. Oh. And you discuss differences and similarities between Gen X and millennials. How has it been going? What do you think of this podcast world? It's so weird, and, but it's so fun. And I'm so grateful for it. Chase auditioned for a show that we were producing, a pilot for Eva Longoria. And we cast her in the lead and I played a part in it too. And I just loved improvising with her. I reached out to her and I said, I don't know what we can do together, but I just love working with you. And I said, I think our age difference is something to play upon. And we decided a podcast would be great. It's 30 minutes of fun, lighthearted comedy, really under the guise of that we're talking about the difference in our ages. Chase is a millennial. I'm a Gen Xer and I love it. I just love, every time we do it, I'm just like so grateful because she's so awesome. That's so cool. Yeah. The tagline is cool dad and a recent grad. That's great. Yeah. All right, John, last two questions. When you were 20 years old, you were at Northwestern. All right. So if you could write your younger 20 year old self, a dear John love letter, what would you tell yourself knowing what you know now? I would say it's going to be okay. Things are not going to turn out the way you thought they should. And that's a good thing. <laughs> it's going to be all right. I mean, here's this guy coming from Kansas said that you probably never could imagine one day you'd be at the Oscars dressed as a caveman. I mean, what a trip. What a trip. Yeah. And even my looking back on my days of using and drinking, I don't look back on them as something I regret. I'm lucky enough that I've been able to lead two lives. Very few people get to do that. So I have these two perspectives on the world. I'm glad I didn't kill anybody. Yeah. And also thank God that that cop messed up. All right. Last question. Do you have any happiness habits? What brings you joy? 
Oh my God. My dogs and my kids would be the first thing I would say. I do a lot of maintenance stuff that I know leads to happiness, but it doesn't give me happiness in the moment. <laughs> like, medita- like meditation. <laughs> meditation is a struggle. Everybody thinks meditation is supposed to be relaxing. I've been doing it for 20 years and it's never been. Do you do it at the same time every day kind of no, thing? No, not since I've had kids. When I was single, oh my God. I'd yeah. like incense. And now I lock myself in my car. Exercise is good. Exercise helps. What kind of dogs do you have? I have a huge 120 pound Alaskan Malamute. Ooh. And, yeah. His name is Diesel. And the other one, his name is Earl. And he's kind of a mix of a golden retriever and something else. Cute uh, yeah. dogs. Oh, dogs are great. The best. Cats are great. I had a cat for a long time, but we live too close to coyotes for cats. Well, I have thoroughly enjoyed this time with you. Here, what a great podcaster you are. Oh, you're so kind. You're Thank you. Now I'm going to up my game. You're <laughs> lazy. You really do it. I don't want to waste your time. You didn't. And, and thank you so much for having me. Thanks for inspiring so many people to see what's on the other side and how amazing your life can be if you get sober. It's so nice to see you through Zoom. Maybe one of these days you, Meredith, and I can all get together. And thank you so much, John. Thank you, Rachel. That was great. Take care. Bye. This is Rachel Steinman. For more information or to contact me with any questions, comments, or guest ideas, please check out rightnowrachel.com. That's right with a W. Thank you so much for listening, subscribing, and sharing, dear family. And if you found value in what you've just heard, I would love and so appreciate a great review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Until next time, I wish you love, happiness, and good mental health.